colleague of mine that worked on rocks for decades, he said, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. The Earth with a diameter of approximately 12,742 kilometers and a circumference of around 40,075 kilometers is a tiny object in comparison to the vastness of the universe. In fact, scientists admit to the complexity of estimating the size of the universe, but current understanding suggests a huge diameter of about 93 billion light years. To give you some context, it takes light almost 93 billion years to travel from the farthest observable objects and reach us. These remarkable facts indicate that the scope of existence extends far beyond our familiar Earth and other planets we know. The vastness of the universe has inspired scientists to actively investigate what exists beyond our planets. This has led to numerous discoveries, including the recent one by Elon Musk, a visionary entrepreneur leading SpaceX, a company dedicated to transforming space technology and enabling life on other planets. He has recently shared fascinating thoughts about the return of a mysterious interstellar object called Oumuamua. He thinks that something unusual is going on, and this mysterious object has grabbed his attention. The truth is the return of Oumuamua has made other scientists also very curious and has had a strong impact on them. This strange object from another star system has made them question what they know about space and has left them with many unanswered questions. But with Elon Musk's curiosity sparked, Oumuamua becomes a captivating subject for exploration as it raises numerous unanswered questions. What is the nature of this peculiar object and what is its purpose? If you've been following closely, you would observe that Oumuamua has been here before, and that's why its return is attention-grabbing. So to find answers to our questions, we need to embark on a journey back in time to uncover the origins of this interstellar object. Oumuamua's journey began in 2017, when it was first detected by astronomer Robert Work, using the powerful Pan-STARRS telescope located at an observatory in Hawaii. Work made a, an extraordinary observation that captured the attention of the scientific community. After Work's discovery, Oumuamua quickly gained a recognition as a unique and captivating object, marking the first confirmed interstellar visitor to our solar system. You see, before then, there had been no records of any interstellar objects. So, it's not surprising that this discovery sparked immense interest and curiosity among scientists leading to extensive research and investigation to unlock the secrets held within this celestial wanderer. In fact, scientists from various disciplines have embraced Oumuamua's presence, as it presents an extraordinary opportunity to expand our knowledge of the universe beyond our own solar system. The observatory played a pivotal role in facilitating the observation and analysis of this interstellar traveler, becoming a hub of activity as researchers eagerly examined its characteristics. In their findings, one of the most intriguing aspects of the objects is its distinctive shape. Scientists have confirmed that it looks like a long cigar-shaped object, which is different from the round or irregular shapes we usually see in objects within our solar system. This unusual shape got scientists very curious and started debates about where it came from and how it formed. And the truth is, its distinctive shape continues to capture the attention of researchers, showing us the incredible variety and mysteries of objects from outside our solar system. Another discovery that captured immense attention is Oumuamua's composition and surface properties. Scientists use different methods to study its color, how it reflects light, and its unique features, with the goal of understanding what substances it is composed of and where it might have come from in space. However, until now, scientists have not reached any specific conclusions in their exploration of the object. As we keep exploring this interstellar object, another aspect that has captured the attention of researchers is its color. Oumuamua stands out with its distinctive reddish hue. You see, most objects in our solar system exhibit a range of colors, but this interstellar object is peculiar. To grasp the extent of the peculiarity of this object, let's take a look at colors of some of the planets around our solar system. Take a look at the Sun, for instance. It appears as a bright white yellowish color. Venus has a yellowish white appearance due to its thick atmosphere. Even Jupiter displays bands of different colors, including shades of yellow, orange, and brown. But with the object, it is displayed as the purest form of red without any added tint or shade. And this peculiarity has sparked scientific interest, leading to investigations into its composition, 
and potential explanations for its unique coloration. And while its color is peculiar, here's another perplexing aspect of Oumuamua. It is the absence of visible dust or a comma, despite its close proximity to the sun, unlike comets. You see, it's important to have a better perspective on what comets are to understand the uniqueness of this object. Comets are celestial objects primarily composed of ice, rock, and dust. When comets get close to the sun, they heat up. This causes the frozen ice inside of them to turn directly into gas, creating a cloud of gas and dust called a comma. The comma expands and spreads out from the solid core of the comet, known as the nucleus. This cloud can be very large, sometimes thousands or even tens of thousands of kilometers across. And as the sun's energy and particles interact with the comet, they create glowing trails. These trails can be made of ionized gas, ion trail, and dust particles, dust trail. The trails can stretch for millions of kilometers and always point away from the sun because of the pressure from sunlight and the solar wind. The presence of the comma and the trails gives comets their distinct appearance when we see them from Earth. They often look fuzzy or hazy, with a trail extending away from the sun. The size and visibility of the comma and the trails can vary depending on the size of the comet and how close it is to the sun. Given the characteristics observed in other celestial objects, such as comets, one might assume that this object would exhibit similar traits. However, this object defies these expectations by lacking visible dust, which deepens the mystery surrounding its composition and behavior. This unconventional nature of this object has intensified scientists' curiosity, especially regarding its origin and true nature. In their quest for answers about its interstellar origins and intriguing features, they have come up with numerous speculations and questions. Is it a fragment of a destroyed planet? Could it be a natural satellite ejected from its planet, or perhaps an artificial object? The truth is, when it comes to this object's identity, scientists have put forward various hypotheses based on the available evidence. Some suggest that it may be a comet shaped by its atmosphere and exhibiting comet-like behavior. Others lean towards the idea of it being an elongated asteroid that has undergone tidal forces. However, the speculations surrounding the object's identity don't stop there. One interesting theory suggests that the object could possibly be a probe sent out by an advanced extraterrestrial civilization. This theory, though captivating, remains highly speculative and lacks concrete evidence. It's important to note that these speculations are still hypotheses and require substantial evidence and research to support them. You need to know that while the potential extraterrestrial origin of the object has sparked interest, Scientists emphasize the need for caution and rigorous investigation before jumping to conclusions. And in a relentless pursuit to satiate the curiosity surrounding the object, scientists made another captivating discovery. They found that the object is currently on a trajectory that will carry it out of our solar system. This revelation begs the question, what triggered its departure and what factors orchestrated this journey away from us? As expected, this departure raises inquiries about the object's future and the possibility of witnessing its return. Tracking its trajectory has become a priority for both scientists and space enthusiasts, driven by the eagerness to uncover further insights into the mysterious interstellar object. And as Oumuamua continues its cosmic voyage, there is uncertainty regarding its encounters with other star systems. Will it encounter another star system in its path, or will it continue its solitary journey through the vastness of interstellar space? To be honest, the answers to these questions are hard to grasp. However, the departure of the object holds immense significance for the scientific community. Its visit provided us with a unique opportunity to observe an object from another star system, expanding our understanding of the universe beyond our own. The object's departure leaves us with a sense of wonder and a desire for further exploration. That's why scientists keep working hard to study the object and unravel its mysteries. They continue to conduct research and examine the data collected during its visit, aiming to learn more about its makeup, behavior, and where it comes from. These studies help us understand interstellar objects better and the vast cosmic realm they navigate. In fact, a project called the Lyra Project has emerged as a source of hope for further exploration. Led by the Initiative for Interstellar Studies, the Lyra Project seeks to evaluate the possibility of sending a spacecraft to Oumuamua and similar interstellar objects within a specific time frame. The project's goals include developing plans for missions, propulsion systems, and technological advancements to make future space journeys possible. Elon Musk, a prominent figure in the space industry, has also shown great interest in supporting initiatives that push the boundaries of space exploration. 
His vision and drive have fueled the development of breakthrough technologies and the advancement of missions to explore the unknown. We know that Elon Musk's commitment to pushing the limits of human exploration aligns with the objectives of studying the object and similar interstellar objects. If we can look ahead, we would realize that the exploration of interstellar objects like this object hold great promise. Future missions could involve spacecraft equipped with advanced instruments and propulsion systems, allowing us to intercept interstellar objects and unveil their secrets. Technological advancements such as laser sails and nuclear thermal rockets offer exciting possibilities for reaching these objects efficiently and conducting detailed scientific investigations. And as ongoing studies continue to shed light on Aumuamua's and similar interstellar objects, the future of exploration looks promising. The Lyra project and the support of the visionaries like Elon Musk propel us forward in our quest to unravel the mysteries of the cosmos. With potential future missions and advancements in technology, we are on the brink of unlocking extraordinary discoveries and expanding our horizons in the realm of space exploration. We must also know that continued research and scientific collaborations are vital in our pursuit of understanding. Not only this object, but also other interstellar objects. Through shared knowledge, innovative technologies, and multidisciplinary approaches, we can unravel the secrets held within these cosmic wanderers. The collective efforts of scientists around the world pave the way for breakthrough discoveries. You see, studying Amuamua opens the door to potential breakthroughs and the acquisition of valuable knowledge. It offers us insights into the composition, formation, and dynamics of interstellar objects. By analyzing its behavior and characteristics, we can expand our understanding of the processes that shape the universe, and perhaps even gain insights into the possibility of extraterrestrial life. As we conclude, we must know that the implications of this object's existence reach far beyond its mysterious journey. It inspires us to dream, explore, and expand our horizons through continued research, collaboration, and scientific endeavors we inch closer to unraveling these mysteries. We hope that it's been an insightful journey, so we want to hear from you. What are your thoughts on Aumuamua and its implications? Do you believe it could be an extraterrestrial visitor or an artifact of natural phenomena? The, the Holy Grail. The We've done a 19-3 flight. We're now uh, qualifying Falcon 9 to be able to do 40 flights, um, and we're aiming for uh, maybe as much as 150 flights this year. I mean, I read a lot about history, and if you look at if you read, read history, you, you see that Civilizations are anything but permanent. The, many civilizations have risen and fallen over the years, over the centuries and millennia. Life cannot just be about solving um, one problem after another. We need things that inspire us. I mean, we need things that you know, move our heart. Elon Musk's quest to save humanity unfolds through the progress of SpaceX Starship, boasting an impressive 193 flights that mark a relentless pursuit of space exploration. I mean, it's incredible how much has happened in eight years. So, you know, I wonder what, what, what will things be like eight years from now? Um, and hopefully we have, I think we will have landed on Mars. Um, and I think we will have sent people to the moon. And, uh, and maybe if we get lucky, we'll have sent people to Mars uh, within eight years. Then SpaceX, the goal is, uh, it's, a, it's a big goal, but it's, we, we want to try to uh, make life multiplanetary, to extend life beyond Earth. And um, I think this is important for a number of reasons, uh, but um, yeah, there's, there's the sort of defensive reason of ensuring that the light of consciousness does not go out. Musk's vision extends beyond Earth, seeking to make life multiplanetary, not merely as a possibility, but as a probable outcome, ensuring the survival and security of civilization. That is our only goal. If we get any information that allows us to improve the design of, of uh, upcoming worlds of Starship, then it is a success. It is purely, inf purely learning. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's really what matters here. The key question is sort of, I think, about for civilization is our, uh, the, the key test perhaps for civilization is do we make it through the spermy great filter of being a, going from a one planet civilization to a multi planet civilization you know pe people do ask me you know uh, have I seen UFOs uh, and aliens and that kind of thing and um, I haven't um, and I think I would have seen them by now 
Um, so it, it appears that we might, we might be the only consciousness, uh, at least in this galaxy. And, um, and if so, that's kind of a scary prospect because uh, it, it means that the light of consciousness is like a, like a tiny candle in a vast darkness. The, the fact that success is one of the possible outcomes is the amazing thing. Um, now we need to make it from being one of the possible outcomes to actually being probable. That's very difficult. The imperative, according to Musk, lies in concrete actions to safeguard Earth and propel humanity towards inhabiting other planets and eventually other star systems. If we do become a multi-planet civilization, we may go out there to other star systems and discover many long one planet civilizations. And we don't want to be one of them. That's lame. We don't want to be one of those lame one planet civilizations. Um, but I think we should always re regard civilization as fragile, as not something that, n not a situation where there is an inevitable upward trajectory. Eventually the sun will expand, boil the oceans, and destroy all life on Earth. Um, now admittedly that's, you know, several hundred million years in the future, but um, it's only about maybe 10 or 20 percent of the existence of Earth itself. If Earth is four and a half billion years old, then another 10, 10, 20 percent um, longer and life would or intelligent life would not have evolved because it's taken us a long time to get to this point. And uh, we should do everything we can to prevent that candle from going out. So, yeah. And, and, and so, so some of the things, so that means obviously taking the actions to ensure that Earth is good, that Earth is safe and secure for civilization. Um, and it, I think it also means ex, ex, extending life beyond Earth um, to other planets in the solar system and ultimately to other star systems. Um, and I think that's, that's both a sort of defense of the light of consciousness and also, um, I think, a point of inspiration. So, you know, that's, that's, really my, that's, that's really the key test. Do we become a self-sustaining multi-planet civilization uh, while, while civilization still exists, or, or, or don't we? That, that, you know, I think that's, that's a, really the key question. Um, I think we've got a good chance, but it's not a sure thing. Um, that's why time is, of the, uh, time is of the essence. I think we want to make Mars self-sustaining as quickly as possible. It's not just a question of getting people to Mars, but it's getting enough tonnage and equipment to Mars to make, enable Mars to be self-sustaining. The, the, the key test being that if the resupply ships from Earth stop coming for any reason, do we, does Mars out or does it continue? The accelerated pace of rocket production becomes a focal point, emphasizing the tangible commitment to advancing space technology at an unprecedented rate. The, what, what, what actually matters here is the, the, the fact that we are, we are building rockets at a rapid pace. So we've, we've got Booster 9, Ship 26, um, almost ready to go, and we have a steady cadence of rocket production afterwards, and with significant improvements between each uh, iteration of the rockets. Um, so you can think of the, 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 the payload for, for this mission is information, uh, information that allows us to improve the design of um, future uh, Starship builds. Fairing recovery, a lesser known aspect, underscores SpaceX's commitment to efficiency and sustainability in every aspect of space travel. At any given point, there's a, like Stephen Hawking actually, I believe said that he thought there was like roughly a 1% chance in any given century of civilization ending. That was his rough estimate. I think it actually might be higher than that. So we just want to go there fast. So uh, this is the, getting back to Falcon 9, back to reality. Um, this is, uh, these are all the launches we've done. And you can see how the cadence of launches has rapidly increased over time. I 
I think people online have actually <laughs> assembled videos showing every every launch, um, and it just gets like crazy fast as you get to 2023. Um, so, and then uh, let's not forget fairing, fairing recovery because actually a lot of people don't realize we re recover the fairing as well. This was actually very difficult to recover the fairing. So it costs a, an immense amount of effort, um, but we now quite regularly recover the fairing and we've uh, reflown fairings 300 times. So congrats to the, the fairing recovery team. That was actually pretty odd. The ambitious goal for the year, aiming for around 150 flights, reveals a determination to push the boundaries of space exploration capabilities. Now, in, in the long term, so it's so difficult to predict what will happen between now and then, um, but in, in the, the long, long run, long run meaning, I don't know, two or three years, um, we, we, sh we should achieve full and rapid reusability. Um, but the physics of this design now allow for that um, in a way that Falcon 9 does not. Um, because we've got much higher performance engines, it's a, there's, some econ there's some economies of scale, um, and um, we're using a, pr a propellant that is a higher ISP. Elon Musk introduces the concept of falling Raptor reusability projecting a future where the cost of a Starship flight could be less than that of an expendable Falcon 1. Yeah, so it's been 15 years since uh, Flight 1 of Falcon 1. Oh, sorry, should Flight 4 of Falcon 1, the first one to reach orbit. Um, so 15 years since we've, we got anything at all to, to orbit. Um, yeah, and now we're aiming to have 150 flights or thereabouts this year. So, and these are big rockets at this point. Falcon 1 is a little rocket. In fact, when I see Falcon 1 right now, I was like, man, I think I'd probably tuck that under my arm and just take it home with me. You know, it was like, launch it in the backyard or something. Uh, it looks so cute. Um, but it, at the time, Falcon 1 did seem like extremely, it, it was extremely difficult. It took us four flights to reach orbit. And um, it did seem kind of big at the time, but now, now it's like, you look adorable thing. Um, so, yeah. So the, uh, the, the most, I think the most profound metric, or the, the metric that really uh, describes the magnitude of what SpaceX uh, achieved in 2023 is the mass to orbit number. So, and you can see the, the incredible change just year over year. Uh, so 2021, we're slightly below rest of world. Uh, 22, we, I think, roughly doubled what the rest of the world did. And um, last year, we were 80% of all mass to orbit. So, uh, when rest of the world, we, we mean like the rest of US industry, you know, Europe, India, China, Japan, everyone. So, uh, there's, there's not a lot of industries where a company is doing like 80% of everything. With an eye on the future, Musk envisions Starship achieving over 200 tons in payload capacity, a remarkable feat made possible by full reusability. With full and rapid reusability, Will, will mean that the, the cost of a Starship flight will be less than the cost of an expendable Falcon 1. Um, so meaning maybe it's a few a million dollars per flight or a few million dollars per flight or something like that. If you have a high flight rate and you have full and rapid reusability, even a rocket the size of Starship might, you know, might, might be a million dollars a flight or something. So, um, which is kind of boggles the mind. Um, and it, and then and you combine that with orbital refilling, um, which requires a, sort of a ship docking with a ship, which we we know how to do because we've figured out docking with Dragon, and if we're docking with ourselves, that's way easier than docking with the space station. Um, so so I th like the exciting thing I think is that this is this is an actual path to being a multi-planet civilization. The prospect of becoming a spacefaring civilization resonates with Musk, as he envisions turning the captivating scenarios of good sci-fi movies into reality, a source of inspiration for all of humanity. What's really mind-boggling is uh, that, that that number should increase by 50% this year. So, I guess on the order of like 90% of all mass to orbit, not, not counting Starship. So if we start, as we start launching Starship, 
Starship is like you know, roughly 100 tons to orbit with every flight. There's a path to getting Starship to do uh, over 200 tons with full reusability. Um, so 200 tons to a useful orbit with full reusability. And um, yeah, it's really an incredible amount. 1,200 tons of useful load to orbit last year. Um, yeah, that's, that's just astounding. So I, I think that, that really deserves a round of applause. Like, like wow, I mean, that's, just, that's the most mind blowing. And the rate of increase is just uh, astonishing. Um, now these numbers will actually look very small in the future. In order to um, build a city on Mars, we'll, we'll need to be kind of in the uh, million ton to orbit range. So maybe a little higher, ideally a little higher, but it's, it's sort of, if you just try to get things to the right order of magnitude, like not trying to get to an exact number, but try to get the order of magnitude right. Um, I think it's, it's on the order, it's roughly a million tons uh, to, to Earth orbit. Uh, that'll, that'll get you roughly 200,000 tons to the surface of Mars. So roughly, you know, approximately 20% of whatever you get to Earth orbit, you can get to the surface of Mars. Um, so, uh, and figure like maybe we need at least a million tons of useful load to the surface of Mars for this, for it to become self-sustaining. In the relentless pursuit of conquering space, Elon Musk and SpaceX emerge as beacons of hope, steering humanity toward a future where the cosmos becomes our collective frontier. That when you wake up in the morning, you're excited to be alive. And being a space-bearing civilization and making true the things that we see in the good science fiction movies, this is one of the things that I think can inspire all of humanity. Just like the, you know, when, when the um, astronauts went to the moon in 69, it was something that, I mean, they said for all mankind, you know, and it really was something you could say to any human on Earth, what's, the, what is, what's like the most amazing thing that humanity has ever done? A lot of, at least one of those things would be, we went to the moon, you know? And so you want to have these inspiring things that make you excited to be alive and excited about the future. So we've got an arduous, I don't know, two or three years ahead of us um, with probably, you know, many bumps on the road. But at the end of that, it sh we, sh we should have something that enables uh, a base on the moon and a, a base on Mars. Um, and we really, really are designing this for just a, for an extremely high mass flux to, this, to the moon and Mars. Uh, and it, you know, it can do both. I think they'll, they'll probably make a good car and uh, probably be successful. So nothing, nothing any of my companies have done has been to stifle competition. In fact, we've done the opposite. So we obviously are, we are working on a low cost electric vehicle that will be made in very high volume. Um, we're like, quite far advanced in that work. So at Tesla, we have open sourced our patents. Anyone can use our patents for free. Elon's latest video delves into the fierce competition between Apple and Tesla, framing it as the clash of giants akin to Google and Apple rivalry. I mean, Google's done a great job of showing the potential of autonomous transport. Right. Um, but they're, they're not a they're not a car company, so they would potentially, you know, license their technology to other car companies. And I think they announced something with the Fiat. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I, I wouldn't say, you know, Google's a competitor. Apple? Uh, yeah, that, that'll be more direct. I, I think they should have um, embarked upon this project sooner, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that that, uh, um, but I don't know. I don't know when they. I mean, they have, you know, they don't share with me the details of their mm -hmm, mm -hmm. production plans. But um, I, I, I don't think it's going to be. I don't think they'll be in volume production sooner than maybe 2020. That'd be like the soonest. Expressing hindsight, Elon Musk suggests an earlier start to the project could have been advantageous for both Tesla and the industry. That'll be more direct? Yeah. 
You can tell that by the hiring pattern and yeah, yeah, that absolutely. kind of stuff. Yeah. So what do you, okay, so they're going to be more direct. How Tesla. do you assess it? Um, I mean, I, I say like, you know, I, I, I think it's great that they're doing this and um, I, um, you know, I hope they, I hope it works out. Despite challenges, Elon exudes optimism, stating that current developments are promising and he holds hope for their success. The car industry is very big, so it's not as though there's, um, you know, one company to the exclusion of others. Uh, I mean, there's like a dozen car companies in the world of, of, of significance. So, uh, and the, the most that any company has is approximately 10% market share. Elon sheds light on market dynamics, revealing that a 10% market share is a significant benchmark for most car companies. It, you know, I feel like a lot of productive things have been done. And you can also look at, te at Tesla as, as being sort of many companies in one. Like our supercharging network is, if it were, it's, if, if the Tesla supercharging network were its own company, it would be a Fortune 500 company by itself. It's just, just the supercharging system. Um, we also make the cells, we, we, we build the power electronics and the powertrain from scratch. Tesla's journey through various industries is spotlighted, with Elon Musk envisioning the company's standalone components as Fortune 500 entities. We focus on making the best products, and, our, and, and Tesla's gotten to where it's gotten with no advertising at all. I understand that. Tesla currently sells uh, two, twice as much uh, in terms of electric vehicles as the rest of uh, electric car makers in, in the United States combined. Tesla has done more to help the environment than uh, all other companies combined. It would be fair to say that, therefore, as a leader of the company, I've done more for the environment than everyone else, and any single human on Earth. Focused on product excellence, Tesla, under Elon's leadership, boasts double the sales of other electric vehicles in the competitive U.S. market. You know, I review the, the, the production line plans for that every week. Um, and I think the the... The revolution in manufacturing that will be represented by that car uh, will blow people's minds. It is not like any car production line that anyone's ever seen. We have the most innovative uh, structural design, the largest castings ever used. Um, we have the, the best manufacturing technology at Tesla, better manufacturing technology than companies that have been doing it for 100 years. So, so th these, these demons of the mind you know, are, for the most part, uh, harnessed to productive ends. Um, okay, so let me ask you that doesn't that. mean that once in a while they, you know, uh, go wrong. Elon Musk anticipates a manufacturing revolution with Tesla products, promising innovations that will leave a lasting impact on the industry. So, but that said, we at Tesla, we do go to great lengths to ensure that our quarter is good, as we, that we don't disappoint. Because it's, it's not so much about the, it's just that we feel like we have a sort of moral obligation to, I don't know, that to, to not have a bad quarter and disappoint people. So we, the number of New Year's Eves that I've spent in delivery centers is like, I don't know, of six, I don't know, <laughs> seven, I don't know, I've lost count how many times I was in, I was delivering cars until like basically midnight on New Year's Eve. Lauding Tesla's structural design and manufacturing prowess, Elon positions the company at the forefront of innovation in the automotive sector. How many companies do you know who've done that? Can you name one? I can't. Um, at SpaceX, we don't use patents. So I mean, said once in a while we'll, we'll file a patent just so some patent troll doesn't cause trouble. But it, we're not stopping any, we've done, we've done nothing anti-competitive. We've done nothing to stop I'm our I'm not suggesting you at all. No, I, 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 I just want to clarify for the audience because some companies have done, done anti-competitive things. I, I, I think the, the strange thing or the unusual thing about SpaceX and Tesla is that we've done things that have helped our competition. So at Tesla, we um, have made our supercharger system open access. We, we've, we've, we, we've made our charger technology available for free to the other manufacturers. The, the reason I... No walled garden. We could have put a wall up. But, but instead, we invited them in. 
the, the thing the thing that's most interesting about this is, is it's a production system. It's, it's a level of production technology that is uh, far in advance of any automotive plant on Earth. Oh, I can hardly wait now. Yeah, yeah. it's gonna be cool. It's gonna be very um, cool. Sure. Yeah, I think we're you know, um, and, and I should point out the uh, that that we will be making the. the the first production line will be here in the Gigafactory in Texas, in, 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 this, in this facility. Oh, I thought it was going to be in Mexico or something. That'll be the second place. Hmm. Wow, that's way cool. It would take too long to complete the factory in Mexico. Elon underlines a moral obligation to weather challenging quarters, showcasing resilience and commitment to long-term success. Tesla, like really to, to make full self driving work, you kind of need baby AGI in the car because you need to understand reality and reality is messy and complicated. And just as, as a side effect, the car AI has to be able to read, for example. It has to be able to read arbitrary signs as a little, just a little side effect of understanding reality in every language. So they, they, everything is coming down to different layers of transformers and diffusion and how you put together the transformers and the diffusion. That's the, well, that's the, why I, I sort of made that somewhat niche AI joke uh, on the X platform. Who do you think will be president in 2032? Transformers or diffusion? Um, uh, Tesla has one of four factories, four vehicle factories in China. Um, and China is, you know, I don't know, a quarter of our market or something like that. Uh, and so it's a quarter of the market of one company. Um, the same is true, by the way, of, of all the other car companies. Uh, they also have something on that order of a quarter of their sales in, in China. Um, so if you, if that's a problem for Tesla, it's a problem for every car company. Um, I mean, I think one has to be careful about not conflating uh, the various companies because I can only do things that are within the bounds of the law. I cannot do beyond that. Um, my aspiration is to do as much good as possible and to be as productive as possible within the bounds of what is legal. More than that, I cannot do. The car is already incredibly good at driving itself. So now, especially if you say like, okay, drive in California, which is both generally easy driving because you don't have heavy rain and snow and that kind of thing in most parts of California. And Tesla engineering is primarily in California. So you're gonna get, it's gonna overfit for solving California. But if you're just driving, say, around Palo Alto, the probability that you'll need an intervention at this point is incredibly low. And in fact, even if you're driving through San Francisco, the probability of an intervention at this point is very low. So we're, we're really just going through a march of nines. Like how many nines of reliability do you need before somebody does not need to monitor the system? Drawing parallels with SpaceX, Elon asserts a commitment to fair competition, emphasizing the absence of patents and anti-competitive practices in the company's ethos. With, without any, uh, doing nothing to provoke the Biden administration, they held an electric vehicle summit at the White House and specifically refused to let Tesla attend. This was in the first six months of the administration. Um, and we inquired, we're like, we literally make more electric cars than everyone else combined. Why are we not allowed? Why are you only letting UA, uh, Ford, GM, Chrysler, and UAW, and you're specifically disallowing us from the EV summit at the White House? We'd, we'd done nothing to provoke them. Um, then uh, Biden went on to add insult to injury um, and publicly said that GM was leading the electric car revolution. This was in the same quarter that Tesla made 300,000 electric cars and GM made 26. The regulator in the U.S. is the enforcement division of NHTSA, for whom I actually have a lot of respect. I think those guys are, they really have, uh, I mean, they're, they're quite, I think, actually, in my experience thus far, have been quite sensible. That that doesn't mean this, that there aren't silly things that happen from time to time, but they've really been quite sensible because they see the actual truth of the accidents and they see the fact that there are on the order of 40,000 people every year in, in motor vehicle accidents. And so, so, so they actually do, they, they do care about the, the safety statistics and they do recognize that, you, that there's always going to be some risk with cars. They're well aware of the fact that our cars are much safer than other vehicles. So we really, I mean, there've been a few things where maybe we have had some disagreements, but like, like for example, coming to an absolute full stop at stop streets, even when it's very clear there are no cars anywhere in sight, 
that could possibly cause an impact. No, no cars, no pedestrians, completely clear. And actually almost no humans stop at stop streets, at stop signs. Almost no humans actually come to a full stop. They're typically, they may think they came to a full stop, but typically they'll be going at least a few miles an hour. Well, I think it's too early to say for sure, but um, I mean, the future is definitely electric. So yeah. companies that are not making a significant investment in electric, electric vehicles are basically consigning themselves to the fate of the horse and buggy market, uh, you know, in the 1920s. Yeah. You know, there were companies that would double down on the on, on horse carriages. Um, and, and actually, uh, you know, so, so you, you, don't, you don't want to be the buggy manufacturer in the age of automobiles. Yes. So they, they said, well, the law does say that you have to stop at a stop street. Well, even though no, almost no humans do. So that actually created a bit of a challenge for us because we had to select the rare cases where, from the fleet where humans actually stopped at stop streets, at stop signs, and, and then actually get our, our team to stop at stop streets and then overfit the stopping, stopping at stop signs in order to get the car to stop at stop signs <laughs> because it was trying to be, behave like a, a sort of good, normal human driver who does not stop at stop signs. So we had a, a disagreement there on it, but we, ultimately have made the car stop at stop signs, even though it's a little annoying. But overwhelmingly, one of the things the media will try to create is that I'm some sort of law-breaking maverick who just does what he wants and doesn't care about legal matters. This is actually not true. Of, of the literally millions of laws that I am subject to and my company is subject to, there are a handful over the years that we've disagreed with. Almost, but the vast majority, 99 point, I don't know, 9% of laws and regulations, we do abide by and we do agree with. I didn't really spend much time on it uh, in the Cybertruck presentation because it, it was hard to explain why it's going to be great. Um, but you have to, if you drive the car, it's right. immediately obvious. Yes, exactly. Um, so the steer by wire means that the the, the, the steering yoke um, is not mechanically connected to the wheels. Yes. So you now, now this is the way that all modern uh, jet airliners are made. It's um, uh, yeah. You know, it's, it's the the sort of the steering yoke or stick on, on a modern airliner is simply a command to the computer. Um, so for the Cybertruck, the, the steering yoke is a command to the computer. So that means we can adjust the gain. Um, which, so uh, and I'll, I'll you know, try to say this in, in ways that say an engineering audience would understand, but also that maybe the, a general audience would also understand. Um, by variable gain, it's kind of like turning out uh, the, if you've got an amplifier or something, you turn the amplifier uh, to a low setting or a high setting. And, and so you can increase the amplification of the motion of your steering yoke um, according to what speed you're driving. So that if you're uh, in a parking lot or it, like if you're low speed driving, then a small movement of the steering yoke uh, results in a big movement in the wheels. So that you can, you, you can do um, you know, a, a U-turn with, with minimal movement of the, the, steer, of the steering yoke. Um, but then if you're on a highway and you're moving very fast, you want um, the wheels to only move a small amount when you move the yoke. So it, right. it's, it's, it, it basically moves the wheels the right amount based on the speed that you're going and what your intentions are. 